And now we come to the great man himself, a man history records as being instrumental in the creation of America's public education system. Horace Mann was an American educator who served as a member of the U.S. House of Representatives, part of the American Congress. Horace Mann was the key reformer of the education system at the time. In 1837, he became the head of the newly created Board of Education in Massachusetts, where he began the work that would eventually earn him the title as the father of American public education. After reading through the educational models of different countries, Mann finally hears about a particularly successful style that had been developed in Prussia, which is now modern-day Germany. The Prussian system had shown to be such a success for the government's purposes that, accompanied by a few other educators, Horace Mann travels to Germany to investigate. Upon their return to the United States, they lobbied heavily to have the Prussian model adopted. All in favor say aye! Interest in Prussia had also been growing in the northern half of the continent. Around this time, the Canadian superintendent of schools, Egerton Ryerson, traveled to Prussia in search of a new model of education. His journeys also included visiting Horace Mann in Massachusetts to further examine the system he would eventually adopt. George Brown, the editor of Toronto's Globe newspaper, was even quoted saying that Ryerson had successfully imported Prussian education into Ontario. During the next 30 years or so, a whole line of American dignitaries came to Germany to earn degrees. Interestingly enough, those who earned degrees in Germany came back to the United States to staff all the major universities. By 1900, all the PhDs in the United States were trained in Prussia. As the first secretary of the State Board of Education, Horace Mann promoted his new concept that the state is the father of children. He stressed that it was the responsibility of the state to ensure that education was provided for the child. A very noble idea, of course, but what exactly did he mean by that? And how did he define education? It seems like a very broad subject. It is a very broad subject. Education encompasses all of human history and all the knowledge we have gathered during that time. Not to mention, and perhaps most importantly, what we as human beings learn over our lifetime on a personal level. Horace Mann's 10th annual report in 1846 led to the first state law that made it mandatory for children to go to school. It was during that year that he supported the governor of Massachusetts in adopting the Prussian model of education for the entire state. How did he do that? The governor of the time, Edward Everett, as it turns out, was the very first to receive a PhD from... can you guess where? That's right, Prussia. From then on it spread very quickly. Just after Everett installed the Prussian model in the state of Massachusetts, the governor of New York set up the very same method in 12 New York schools. Horace Mann's sister, Elizabeth Peabody, of the Peabody Foundation, saw to it that right after the Civil War, the Prussian system that was then being taught in the northern states was integrated into the conquered south. By 1900, most of the compulsory schooling laws that implemented the new system had been passed. From then on, every American child grew up under the Prussian system. So what exactly was the Prussian education system that everyone thought was so amazing that it just had to be adopted throughout the free world? To give you just a bit of background, in the 18th century, the Kingdom of Prussia, which is now modern-day Germany, was among the first countries of the world to introduce free and compulsory education. After the Prussians were defeated by Napoleon in 1806, it was decided that the reason why the battle was lost was that the Prussian soldiers were thinking for themselves in the battlefield instead of following orders. To make sure that this couldn't happen again, a new eight-year system of schooling was created. This new system provided not only the skills needed for the early industrialized world, such as reading, writing, and arithmetic, but also a strict education that taught duty, discipline, respect for authority, and the ability to follow orders. Elite children destined for higher offices went on to attend private schools, while the rest of the population had no access to the secondary education. They were destined for the working class. Through this new system, the Prussian court tried to create social obedience in the citizens through indoctrination. Every individual had to become convinced at the core of their being that the king was just, his decisions were always right, and the need for obedience paramount. In truth, the entire purpose of the system was to instill loyalty to the crown and to train young men for the military and bureaucracy. To do this, it was necessary to squeeze out all independent thinking from the masses. Influencing this new system from the beginning 
was Prussian philosopher Johann Gottlieb Fichte. Combining John Locke's view that the children are a blank slate and Rousseau's ideas on how to write on that slate, Prussia established an educational system that was considered scientific in nature. An important part of the Prussian system was that it defined for the child what was to be learned, what was to be thought about, and how long to think about it. In order to have an efficient policy-making class and a subclass beneath it, it was believed that one had to remove the power of most people to make sense out of the available information. In other words, critical thinking had to be done away with. Now, if you're wondering why the average person doesn't know that the North American education system is based directly on the Prussian model, it might just be because its original purpose was not designed for the good of the individual, but for the good of the government. The philosophy of Johann Fitch directly influenced the creation of the Prussian model of schooling. As he is quoted saying, The schools must fashion the person, and fashion him in such a way that he simply cannot will otherwise than what you wish him to will. With quotes like these, you can see why his involvement is not well known. Education should aim at destroying free will, so that after pupils are thus schooled, they will be incapable throughout the rest of their lives of thinking or acting otherwise than as their schoolmasters would have wished. When this technique has been perfected, every government that has been in charge of education for more than one generation will be able to control its subjects securely without the need of armies or policemen. In 1807, in a Berlin occupied by Napoleon, Johann Fitch gave a series of famous addresses to the German nation. Fitch spoke of the superiority of German people above all others. The content of these speeches was a catalyst for the Prussian education system and German nationalism. In other earlier works, he calls Jews a state within a state that would, quote, undermine the German nation. He openly expressed a desire to expel Jews from Germany. Fitch had a deep influence on the rise of the Third Reich, and continues to be deemed, quote, the spiritual father of modern neo-Nazism. Which begs the question, why would the father of American education make it a law that every child spend their youth in a system created by the father of neo-Nazism? Historians reflect that one of the greatest social factors that allowed a man like Hitler to rise to power was that the German people had been bred from birth to respect authority above all else and accept it without question. Which begs another question. If the entire population of North America is raised in a system adopted from pre-Nazi Germany, what are we setting ourselves up for?